Section 30 of The Jolly Parisians and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brandon Weston. Marguerite by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 5. Back from the Grave. My first impulse was to find the custodian of the cemetery and to ask him to have me conducted home, but vague ideas prevented me from following this course. My return would create general alarm. Why should I hurry now that I was the master of the situation? I felt my limbs. I had only an insignificant wound on my left arm, where I had bitten myself, and a slight feverishness lent me unhoped-for strength. Still I lingered. All sorts of troubled visions confused my mind. I had felt beside me in the open grave some sexton's tools which had been left there, and I conceived a sudden wish to repair the damage I had made, to close up the hole through which I had crept, so as to conceal all traces of my resurrection. I do not believe that I had any positive motive in doing so. I only deemed it useless to proclaim my adventure, feeling ashamed to find myself alive when the whole world thought me dead. In half an hour every trace of my escape was obliterated, and then I climbed out of the hole. The night was splendid, and deep silence reigned in the cemetery. The black trees threw motionless shadows over the whiteness of the tombs. When I endeavored to ascertain my bearings, I noticed that one half of the sky was reddened as if lit up by a huge conflagration. Paris was in that direction, and I moved towards it, following a long avenue amid the darkness of the branches. However, after I had gone some fifty yards, I was compelled to stop, feeling faint and weary. I then sat down on a stone bench, and for the first time looked at myself. I was fully attired, with the exception that I had no hat. I blessed my beloved Marguerite for the pious thought which had prompted her to dress me in my best clothes, those which I had worn at our wedding. That remembrance of my wife brought me to my feet again. I longed to see her without delay. At the further end of the avenue I had taken, a wall arrested my progress. However, I climbed to the top of a monument, reached the summit of the wall, and then dropped over the other side. Although rudely shaken by the fall, I managed to walk for a few minutes along a broad, deserted street skirting the cemetery. I had no notion as to where I was, but with the reiteration of monomania, I kept saying to myself that I was going towards Paris, and that I should find the Rue Dauphine somehow or other. Several people passed me, but seized with sudden distrust, I would not stop them and ask my way. I have since realized that I was then in a burning fever, and already nearly delirious. Finally, just as I reached a large thoroughfare, I became giddy and fell heavily upon the pavement. Here there is a blank in my life. For three whole weeks I remained unconscious. When I awoke at last I found myself in a strange room. A man who was nursing me told me quietly that he had picked me up one morning on the boulevard Montparnasse and had brought me to his house. He was an old doctor who had given up practicing. When I attempted to thank him, he sharply answered that my case had seemed a curious one and that he had wished to study it. Moreover, during the first few days of my convalescence, he would not allow me to ask a single question, and later on he never put one to me. For eight days longer I remained in bed, feeling very weak, and not even trying to remember, for memory was a weariness and a pain. I felt half ashamed and half afraid. As soon as I could leave the house, I would go and find out whatever I wanted to know. Possibly in the delirium of fever a name had escaped me, but the doctor never alluded to anything that I may have said. His charity was not only generous, it was discreet. The summer had come at last, and one warm June morning I was at length permitted to take a short walk. The sun was shining with that joyous brightness which imparts renewed youth to the streets of old Paris. I went along slowly, questioning the passers-by at every crossing I came to, and asking the way to Rue Dauphine. When I reached the street I had some difficulty in recognizing the lodging house where we had alighted on our arrival in the capital. A childish terror made me hesitate. If I appeared suddenly before Marguerite, the shock might kill her. It might be wiser to begin by revealing myself to our neighbor, Madame Gabin. Still, I shrank from taking a third party into my confidence. 
I seemed unable to arrive at a resolution, and yet in my innermost heart I felt a great void, like that left by some sacrifice long since consummated. The building looked quite yellow in the sunshine. I had just recognized it by a shabby eating house on the ground floor where we had ordered our meals, having them sent up to us. Then I raised my eyes to the last window of the third floor on the left-hand side, and as I looked at it a young woman with tumbled hair, wearing a loose dressing gown, appeared and leant her elbows on the sill. A young man followed and imprinted a kiss upon her neck. It was not Marguerite. Still, I felt no surprise. It seemed to me that I had dreamt all this, with other things, too, which I was to learn presently. For a moment I remained in the street, uncertain whether I had better go upstairs and question the lovers who were still laughing in the sunshine. However, I decided to enter the little restaurant below. When I started on my walk, the old doctor had placed a five-franc piece in my hand. No doubt I was changed beyond recognition, for my beard had grown during the brain fever, and my face was wrinkled and haggard. As I took a seat at a small table, I saw Madame Gabin come in, carrying a cup. She wished to buy two sous' worth of coffee. Standing in front of the counter, she began to gossip with the landlady of the establishment. Well, said the latter, so the poor little woman of the third floor has made up her mind at last, eh? How could she help herself? answered Madame Gabin. It was the very best thing for her to do. Monsieur Simoneau showed her so much kindness. You see, he had finished his business in Paris to his satisfaction, for he has inherited a pot of money. Well, he offered to take her away with him to his own part of the country, and place her with an aunt of his, who wishes a housekeeper and companion. The landlady laughed archly. I buried my face in a newspaper which I picked off the table. My lips were white and my hands shook. It will all end in marriage, of course, resumed Madame Gabin but I can swear on my honor that I have never seen anything the least suspicious. The little widow mourned for her husband very properly, and the young man was extremely well behaved. Well, they left last night. Just then the side door of the restaurant, communicating with the passage of the house, opened, and Dede appeared. Mother, ain't you coming? she cried. I'm waiting, you know. Do be quick. Presently, said the old mother testily, don't bother. The girl stood listening to the two women, with the precious shrewdness of a child born and reared amid the streets of Paris. When all is said and done, explained Madame Gabin, the dear departed did not come up to Monsieur Simono. I didn't fancy him over much. He was a puny sort of man, a poor, fretful fellow, and he hadn't a sou to bless himself with. No, candidly, he wasn't the kind of husband for a young and healthy wife, whereas Monsieur Simonot is rich, you know, and as strong as a Turk. Oh, yes, interrupted Dede, that's so. Get along with you, screamed the old woman, shoving the girl out of the restaurant. You're always poking your nose where it has no business to be. Then she concluded with these words. Look here, to my mind the other one did quite right to take himself off. It was fine luck for the little woman. When I found myself in the street again, I walked along slowly with trembling limbs. And yet I was not suffering much. I think I smiled once at my shadow in the sun. It was quite true. I was very puny. It had been a queer notion of mine to marry Marguerite. I recalled her weariness at Gironde, her impatience, her dull, monotonous life. The dear creature had been very good to me but I had never been a real lover. She had mourned for me as a sister, for her brother, not otherwise. Why should I again disturb her life? A dead man is not jealous. When I lifted my eyelids, I saw the Garden of Luxembourg before me. I entered it and took a seat in the sun, dreaming with a sense of infinite restfulness. The thought of Marguerite stirred me softly. I pictured her in the provinces, beloved, petted and very happy, she had grown handsomer, and she was the mother of three boys and two girls. It was all right. I have behaved like an honest man in dying, and I would not commit the cruel folly of coming to life again. Since then I have traveled a good deal. I have been a little bit everywhere. I am an ordinary man who has toiled and eaten like anybody else. Death no longer frightens me, but it does not seem to care for me now that I have no motive in living and I sometimes fear that I have been forgotten upon earth. End of section 30
Section 31 of The Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Soldier's Dreams by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Four soldiers, the night after the victory, had encamped in a deserted corner of the field of battle. Darkness had come on, and they were supping joyously amid the slain. Seated in the grass, around a fire, they were broiling on the coals cuts of lamb, which they devoured still bleeding. The ruddy gleam of the fire vaguely illuminated them, projecting afar their gigantic shadows. At times, pale flashes ran over the weapons lying around them, and then one saw amid the darkness men who were sleeping with open eyes. The soldiers laughed in long bursts without seeing those glances which were fixed upon them. The day had been a hard one. Not knowing what the morrow had in store for them, they were enjoying the food and rest of the moment. Night and death were flying over the field of battle, down on which their huge wings shook silence and terror. The repast finished, Noose sang. His sonorous voice was broken in the sad and troubled air. The song, joyous on his lips, was echoed back like a sob. Astonished at these accents which came from his mouth and which he did not recognize, the soldier sang in a louder tone, when a terrible cry, emerging from the gloom, shot through space. Noose paused, seized with uneasiness. He said to Elberg, "'Go see what corpse has awakened.' Elberg took a flaming brand and departed. His companions were able to follow him for a few instants by the light of the torch. They saw him bend, examining the dead, searching among the bushes with his sword. Then he disappeared. Clarion, said Noose, after a period of silence, the wolves are roaming about tonight. Go seek our friend. And Clarion, in his turn, was lost in the darkness. Noose and Flem, weary of waiting, wrapped themselves in their cloaks and stretched themselves out beside the half-extinguished fire. Their eyes closed when the same terrible cry passed over their heads. Flem silently arose and walked towards the gloom in which his two companions had vanished. Then Noose found himself alone. He was afraid, afraid of that black gulf through which ran a rattle of agony. He threw some dry grass on the fire hoping that the brightness of the flame would drive away his terror. The flame mounted with a bloody look. The ground was lighted up in a broad, luminous circle. In this circle, the bushes danced fantastically, and the dead, who were sleeping in their shadows, seemed shaken by invisible hands. Noose grew afraid of the light. He scattered the burning grass, extinguished it beneath his heels. As the darkness returned, heavier and thicker than before, he shivered, dreading to hear the cry of death pass. He seated himself, then arose to call his companions. His shouts terrified him. He feared he had attracted the attention of the corpses. The moon appeared, and Noose saw with terror a pale ray glide over the field of battle. Now the night no longer concealed the horror. The devastated plain, sown with wrecks and with the dead, stretched away before his eyes, covered with a winding sheet of light, and this light, which was not that of day, illuminated the shadows, without dissipating their silent terrors. Noose, standing there, with sweat upon his forehead, thought of climbing the hill to put out the pale torch of night. He asked himself what kept the dead from starting up and coming to surround him, now that they saw him. Their motionlessness filled him with anguish. In the expectation of some terrible event, he closed his eyes. And, as he stood there, he felt something lukewarm touch his left heel. He stooped towards the ground when he perceived a thin stream of blood fleeing beneath his feet. This stream, bounding from pebble to pebble, flowed with a gay murmur. It came from the darkness. It twisted itself in a ray of the moon to flee and return to the darkness. One might have likened it to a serpent with black scales, the rings of which slipped along and followed each other incessantly. Noose recoiled. 
without the power to close his eyes again. A frightful contraction kept them wide open, fixed on the bloody stream. He saw it swell slowly, widen in its bed. The stream became a brook, a slow and quiet brook, over which an infant could have leaped at a single spring. The brook became a torrent and swept over the ground with a hollow noise, hurling upon its sides a ruddy foam. The torrent became a river, an immense river. This river bore away the corpses, and it was a horrible prodigy that the blood had flowed from wounds in such abundance that it carried the dead along with it. Noose still recoiled before the swelling flood. He could no longer see the other shore. It seemed to him that the valley was being changed into a lake. Suddenly he found himself with his back against a wall of rocks. He was forced to arrest his flight. Then he felt the waves beat his knees. The corpses, which the current was bearing along, insulted him as they passed. Each one of their wounds had become a mouth which jeered at him because of his fright. The thick sea swelled, swelled incessantly. Now it was groaning around his hips. He drew himself up with a supreme effort. He clung to the clefts of the rocks. The rocks crumbled, he fell back, and the flood covered his shoulders. The pale, sad moon looked down on this sea in which its rays were extinguished without reflection. The light floated in the sky. The immense sheet, all darkness and noise, seemed the yawning opening of an abyss. The flood rose, rose. It reddened Noose's lips with its foam. At dawn, Elberg, on arriving, awakened Noose, who was sleeping, his head upon a stone. "'Friend,' said he, "'I got lost among the bushes. As I had seated myself at the foot of a tree, sleep surprised me, and the eyes of my soul saw strange scenes unrolled, the remembrance of which waking has been unable to dissipate. The world was in its infancy. The sky seemed an immense smile. The earth, virgin yet, bloomed in the May sunshine in its chaste nudity. The green grass was taller than our tallest oaks. The trees spread out in the air foliage unknown to us. The sap flowed plentifully in the veins of the world, and its flood was so abundant that not being able to contain itself with the plants, it streamed into the entrails of the rocks and gave them life. The horizon stretched away calm and radiant. Holy nature had awakened. Like the infant which kneels in the morning and thanks God for the light, it poured forth towards the sky all its perfumes, all its songs, penetrating perfumes, ineffable songs which my senses could scarcely bear, so divine was the impression they produced. The mild and fertile earth brought forth without pain, fruit trees grew, wild fields of grain bordered the roads as fields of nettle do now. One felt in the air that human sweat had not yet mingled with the breadth of heaven. God alone toiled for his children. Man, like the bird, lived by providential nourishment. He strolled at will, blessing God, gathering the fruits of the trees, drinking the water of the springs, sleeping at night beneath the shelter of the foliage. His lips had a horror of flesh. He was ignorant of the taste of blood. He relished only the food prepared for his repasts by the dew and the sun. Thus man remained innocent, and his innocence crowned him king of the other beings of the creation. All was concord. I know not what whiteness the world had, what supreme peace soothed it without end. The wings of the birds did not flap for flight. The forests had no places of refuge in their copses. All the creatures of God lived in the sunlight, forming but a single people, having but a single law, kindness. I walked among these beings amid this nature. I felt myself grow stronger and better. My breaths breathed long draughts of the air of heaven. I felt, suddenly quitting our infected winds for these breezes of a purer world, the delicious sensation experienced by a miner ascending to the open air. As the angel of dreams still presided over my sleep, this is what my soul saw in a forest into which it had strayed. Two men were following a narrow path, lost beneath the foliage. The younger of the twain walked in front, carelessness sang upon his lips. His glance had a caress for each tuft of grass. Sometimes he turned to smile on his companion. I know not by what gentleness I recognized his smile as that of a brother. The lips and eyes of the other man remained dumb and somber. He glared at the nape of the youth's neck with a look of hatred, 
hastening his steps, stumbling behind him. He seemed to be pursuing a victim who did not flee. I saw him cut down a stout sapling, the trunk of which he rudely fashioned into a club. Then, fearing he might lose his companion, he ran, concealing his weapon behind him. The young man who had seated himself to wait for him arose at his approach and kissed him on the forehead, as after a long absence. They resumed their walk. The day was declining. The youth hurried along, on perceiving in the distance, between the last trees of the forest, the soft lines of a hill, yellow with the adieu of the sun. The somber man thought he was fleeing. Then he raised his club. His young brother turned. A joyous word of encouragement was upon his lips. The club crushed his face, and the blood gushed forth. The tuft of grass, which received the first drop of it, shook it with horror on the soil. The soil swallowed it, quivering, terrified. A long cry of repugnance escaped from its bosom, and the sand of the path vomited forth the hideous draught in the shape of a bloody moss. At the cry of the victim I saw the creatures scatter on the wings of fright. They fled throughout the world, shunning the beaten ways. They posted themselves at the crossroads, and the stronger attacked the weaker. I saw them in solitude polish their fangs and sharpen their claws. The grand brigandage of the creation had begun. Then the eternal flight passed before me. The sparrow-hawk swooped down upon the swallow. The swallow on the wing seized the gnat. The gnat placed itself upon the corpse. From the worm to the lion, every creature felt itself menaced. The world, like a serpent, bit its tail and devoured itself eternally. Nature, stricken with horror, had a long convulsion. The pure lines of the horizon were broken. The aurora and the setting sun acquired bloody clouds. The waters hurled themselves down with perpetual sobs, and the trees, twisting their branches, annually cast withered leaves upon the ground. As Elberg stopped, Clarion appeared. He seated himself between his two companions and said to them, I know not whether I saw or dreamed what I am about to relate. So much of reality had the dream, so like a dream appeared the reality. I found myself upon a highway which traversed the world. It was bordered by cities, and the nations followed it in their journeys. I saw that the stones with which this highway was paved were black. My feet slipped, and I realized they were black with blood. The highway sloped on each side. A brook flowing in the center rolled thick red water. I followed this highway in which the crowd was stirring violently. I went from group to group, seeing life pass before me. Here, fathers were immolating their daughters, whose blood they had promised to some monstrous god. The flaxen-haired girls were bending beneath the knife, pale at the kiss of death. There, quivering and proud maidens were stabbing themselves to escape a shameful fate, and the tomb would serve as a white robe for their purity. Further off, lady-loves were dying beneath kisses. This one, weeping because of her abandonment, was expiring upon the strand, her eyes fixed on the waves which had borne away her heart. That one, assassinated in her lover's arms, was breathing her last upon his neck, both transported in an eternal embrace. Further off still, men, weary of gloom and misery, were sending their souls to find in a better world that liberty vainly sought for on this earth. Everywhere the feet of kings had left bloody imprints upon the stones. This one had walked in his brother's blood, that one in the blood of his people, that other in the blood of his god. Their red footmarks in the dust made the crowd say, A king has passed here. Priests were slaughtering victims, then stupidly, bent over their palpitating entrails, they claimed to read in them the secrets of heaven. They wore swords beneath their robes and preached war in the name of their god. The nations, on hearing their voices, falling one upon another, devoured themselves for the glorification of the common father. All men were intoxicated. They beat the walls, they groveled upon the stones, polluted by a hideous mud. With closed eyes, holding with both hands double-edged blades, they struck in the dark and massacred. A humid breath of carnage passed over the crowd, which lost itself in the distance in a reddish mist. It ran, carried away by a rush of fear. It rolled in the orgy with clamors more and more furious. It trod underfoot those who fell and made the wounds give up the last drop of blood. 
It panted with rage, cursing the corpse when it could no longer tear from it a groan. The soil drank, drank greedily. Its entrails no longer manifested repugnance for the biting liquor. Like a being debased by drunkenness, it gorged itself with lees. I increased my pace, being in haste to lose sight of my brethren. The black highway still extended before me, as vast as ever at each new horizon. The brook which I followed seemed bearing the bloody flood to some unknown sea. And as I advanced, I saw nature grow somber and severe. The bosoms of the plains tore themselves deeply. Blocks of stone divided the soil into sterile hills and dark valleys. The hills mounted, the valleys hollowed themselves out more and more. Stones became mountains, furrows were changed into abysses. Not a leaf, not a tuft of moss. Desolate rocks, their tops whitened by the sun, their bases shadowy and swallowed up by the gloom. The highway passed amid these rocks, where death-like silence reigned. At length it made a sudden turn, and I found myself upon a funereal sight. Four mountains, leaning heavily one on the other, formed an immense basin. Their hard, smooth sides, which rose up like the walls of a Cyclopean city, made of the enclosed space a gigantic pit, the largeness of which filled the horizon. And this pit, into which the brook fell, was full of blood. The thick and tranquil flood mounted slowly from the abyss. It seemed slumbering upon its bed of rocks. The sky reflected it in clouds of purple. Then I comprehended that there flowed all the blood shed by violence. Since the first martyr, each wound had wept its tears in this gulf, and the tears had coursed there so abundantly that the gulf was filled. I saw, last night, said Noose, a torrent going to cast itself into that accursed lake. Stricken with horror, resumed Clarion, I approached the brink, sounding with a glance the depth of the flood. I realized from the hollow noise of the tide that it extended to the center of the earth. Then my eyes, being turned towards the surrounding rocks, I saw that the flood was gaining their tops. The voice of the abyss cried out to me, The tide which is rising will rise constantly and attain the summits. It will rise further, and then a river escaping from the terrible basin will hurl itself into the plains. The mountains, weary of struggling with the billows, will sink. The entire lake will fall upon the world and inundate it. Thus the men who shall be born will die, drowned in the blood shed by their fathers. The day is near, said Noose. The waves were high last night. The sun had risen when Clarion finished the recital of his dream. A trumpet blast borne by the morning wind was heard towards the north. It was the signal to reassemble around the standard the soldiers scattered into the plain. The three companions arose and gathered up their weapons. They were departing, casting a last look at the extinguished fire, when they saw Flem running towards them through the high grass. His feet were white with dust. "'Friends,' said he, "'I know not from whence I come, so rapid has been my journey. During long hours I saw the disheveled round of trees flee behind me. The sound of my footsteps, which soothed me, caused me to close my eyelids, and still running, without relaxing my speed, I slept a strange sleep.' I found myself upon a desolate hill. The glowing sun struck the huge rocks. I could not put down my feet without burning their flesh. I hastened on. And, as I bounded along, I saw a man ascending, who walked slowly. He was crowned with thorns. A heavy burden weighed upon his shoulders. A bloody sweat inundated his face. He walked toilsomely, staggering at every step. The soil burned. I could not bear its torture. I ascended to wait for him beneath a tree at the top of the hill. Then I perceived that he bore a cross. From his crown, from his purple robe stained with mud, I believed him a king, and was greatly rejoiced at his suffering. Soldiers followed him, quickening his pace with the points of their lances. Arrived upon the most elevated rock, they stripped him of his garments. They laid him on the sinister cross. The man smiled sadly. He stretched out his hands wide open to the executioners. The nails made two bloody holes in them. Then drawing his feet together, he crossed them, and a single nail sufficed. Lying upon his back, he silently contemplated the sky. Two tears ran slowly down his cheeks, tears which he did not feel, and which lost themselves in the resigned smile of his lips. The cross was erected. 
the weight of the body horribly enlarged the wounds and i heard the bones break the crucified gave a long shiver then he resumed his contemplation of the sky i gazed at him seeing his grandeur at the hour of death i said to myself this man is not a king then i was filled with pity i cried to the soldiers to strike him to the heart a tomtit sang upon the cross its song was sad and sounded in my ears like the voice of a weeping maiden blood colors the flame sang the bird blood purples the flower blood reddens the cloud i alighted on the sand my claws were bloody i graced the branches of an oak my wings were red i met a good man and followed him i bathed myself in a spring and my plumage was pure my song said rejoice my feathers on the shoulder of this man you will no longer be soiled by the rain of murder my song says today weep bird of golgotha weep for your plumage stained by the blood of him who kept for you the asylum of his bosom he came to restore purity to the birds but alas men force him to moisten me with the dew of his wounds i doubt and i weep for my stained plumage where shall i find another who will open for me his linen garment ah my poor master who will wash my feathers which thou hast reddened with thy blood the crucified listened to the songster the wind of death made his eyelids tremble agony twisted his lips he lifted towards the bird his glance full of gentle reproach his smile sparkled as serene as hope then he uttered a loud cry his head fell upon his breast and the tom tit fled borne away in a groan the sky grew black the earth shook in the gloom I was yet running and yet slept the dawn had come the valley had awakened smiling amid the morning mists the storm of the past night had given more serenity to the sky more vigor to the green leaves but the path was bordered by the same thorns which had torn me on the preceding day the same hard sharp stones rolled beneath my feet the same serpents crawled among the bushes and menaced me as i passed the blood of the good man had flowed into the veins of the old world without restoring it to the innocence of its youth the tom tit passed above my head and cried to me i am very sad i cannot find a spring pure enough to bathe myself in look the earth is as wicked as it was yesterday the lord is dead and the grass has not flourished alas it was but another murder friends said noose ours is a vile calling our sleep is troubled by the phantoms of those we slay like you i have felt the demon of nightmare weigh upon my breast for thirty years i have been killing i have need of rest let us leave our brothers here i know a valley in which the ploughs lack arms is it your wish that we shall taste the bread of toil it is our wish answered his companions then the soldiers dug a great hole at the base of a rock and buried their weapons they went down to bathe themselves in the river then locking arms all four they vanished at a turn of the road end of section 31 section 32 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand The Fast by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox When the vicar ascended the pulpit, with his ample surplus of angelic whiteness, the little baronne was devoutly seated in her accustomed place, near the heater register before the chapelle de saint ange after the usual period of thoughtful silence devoted to the contemplation of heavenly things the vicar daintily passed a fine cambric handkerchief across his lips then he opened his arms like a seraph about to fly away bowed his head and spoke his voice was at first in the vast nave as a distant murmur of flowing water as a languishing lament of the wind amid the foliage and little by little the murmur swelled the breeze became a hurricane the voice rolled beneath the vaulted roof with majestic thunder peals but always at certain instants even in the midst of its most formidable thunder peals the vicar's voice was suddenly softened 
casting a bright ray of sunlight into the heart of the somber tempest of its eloquence. The little baron, at the first whispers among the leaves, had assumed the eager and charmed attitude of a person with a delicate ear who prepares to enjoy all the subtleties of a beloved symphony. She seemed entranced by the exquisite sweetness of the introductory musical phrases. She afterwards followed, with the attention of a connoisseur, the swelling of the voice, the growth of the final tempest so artistically managed, and when the voice had acquired its full development, when it thundered, augmented by the echoes of the nave, the little baron did not restrain a discreet bravo, a wag of the head indicative of satisfaction. From that point it was celestial enjoyment. All the devotees yielded to the spell. Meanwhile the vicar had said something. His music had accompanied words. He had preached about fasting. He had said how agreeable to God was the mortification of the flesh. Leaning on the edge of the desk, like a huge white bird, he sighed. The hour has come, my brethren and sisters, when all of us must, following Christ's example, bear our crosses, crown ourselves with thorns, and ascend our Calvary, dragging our bare feet over the stones and through the brambles. The little baron, without doubt, thought this phrase beautifully rounded, for she gently winked her eyes as it tickled around the heart. Then the vicar's symphony soothed her, and, while continuing to follow the melodious phrases, she allowed herself to sink into a partial reverie, full of peculiar delight. Opposite to her she saw one of the long windows of the choir gallery, gray with mist. The rain must yet be falling. The dear lady had come to hear the sermon amid atrocious weather. One should suffer a little when one is religious. Her coachman had been frightfully drenched, and she herself, in springing to the pavement, had slightly wet the toes of her delicate boots. Her coupé, however, was excellent, tightly closed and cushioned like an alcove. But it was so disheartening to see, through the damp panes of glass, a file of hurried umbrellas rushing along each sidewalk. And she thought that if it had been clear, she could have come in her Victoria. That would have been a great deal gayer. In her secret soul she was terribly troubled lest the vicar might bring his discourse to too speedily a conclusion. In that case she would be compelled to wait for her carriage, for certainly she could never think of wading home through such a storm. And she calculated that at the rate he was going, the vicar would never in the world have sufficient voice to hold out two hours. Her coachman then would arrive too late. This anxiety somewhat disturbed her devotional joy. The vicar, with a sudden fit of anger, which straightened him up, his locks fluttering, his fists thrust forward, like a man in the grasp of the spirit of vengeance, thundered, Woe be to you, especially, sister sinners, if you do not pour upon the feet of Christ the perfume of your remorse, the odorous oil of your repentance. Believe me, tremble and fall on your knees upon the stones. It is by shutting yourselves up in the purgatory of penance, opened by the church during these days of universal contrition. It is by wearing away the marble slabs of the temple floor with your foreheads pallid through fasting, by descending into the anguish of hunger and cold, of silence and darkness, that you will merit the divine pardon on the lightning-clothed day of triumph. The little baron, drawn from her preoccupation by this terrible outburst, slowly wagged her head, as if she fully shared the opinion of the angry priest. One should take a bundle of rods, go into a very dark, very damp, and very icy corner, and there castigate one's flesh. She had no doubt whatever about that. Then she fell back into her reverie. She lost herself in the depths of profound comfort, of delicious ecstasy. She was seated at her ease on a low chair with a broad back, and beneath her feet was an embroidered cushion, which prevented her from feeling the cold of the marble slabs. Half reclining, she enjoyed the church, that vast interior through which floated the vapor of incense, the depths of which filled with mysterious shadows, overflowed with adorable visions. The nave, with its red velvet hangings, its ornaments of gold and marble, its air of an immense boudoir full of intoxicating odors, illuminated as with the soft light of a night lamp, close and seemingly prepared for superhuman love, had, little by little, enveloped her with the charm of its pomp. 
It was the fete of her senses. Her pretty, plump form surrendered at discretion, fascinated, soothed, and caressed. She was engulfed in a vast sea of beatitude. But that which gave her the most delicious sensations was the warm breadth of the heater register open almost beneath her skirts. The little baronne was very chilly. The register discreetly breathed its ardent caresses along her silk stockings. Drowsiness seized upon her in this bath of luxurious softness. The vicar was still full of anger. He plunged all the devotees present into the boiling oil of the infernal regions. If you do not listen to the voice of God, he thundered, if you do not listen to my voice, which is the representative of God's, verily I say unto you, one day you will hear your bones crack with anguish, you will feel your flesh break asunder on the glowing coals, and then in vain you will cry, Pity, Lord, pity, I repent. God will be without mercy, and with his foot will hurl you back into the abyss. At this explosion there was a shiver among the congregation. The little baronne, who had been almost put to sleep by the warm air circulating beneath her skirts, smiled vaguely. She knew the vicar well. The previous day he had dined at her hotel. He adored pâté de saumon truffet, and pomar was his favorite wine. He was indeed a handsome man, from thirty-five to forty, dark and with a visage so round and so rosy that one would have readily taken it for the merry visage of a female farm-servant. With this he was a man of society, a good eater, a fluent conversationalist. The women adored him, and the little baronne was passionately fond of him. He said to her, in a voice so deliciously sweet, Ah, madame, with such a toilet, you would damn a saint. But he was not damned, the dear man. He hastened away to rattle off to the countess, the marquess, and his other penitents the same gallant phrase, which made him the spoiled darling of those ladies. When he went to dine at the little baronne's hotel on Thursday, she cared for him as if he were a delicate creature whom the slightest current of air would afflict with the cold, and to whom a tough piece of meat would infallibly give an attack of dyspepsia. In her salon, his armchair was beside the fireplace. At table, the domestics had standing orders to keep a special watch over his plate, and to pour out for him alone a certain pomard, twelve years old, which he drank with his eyes fervently closed, as if he had taken communion. The vicar was so kind, so kind. While, from the elevated pulpit, he spoke of cracking bones and burning limbs, the little baron, half asleep as she was, saw him at her table, devoutly wiping his lips and saying to her, Ah, madame, this soup would make you find favor in heaven if your beauty were not already sufficient to make you certain of paradise. When the vicar had exhausted his anger and his threats, he began to sob. Such was his habitual method of procedure. Almost on his knees in the pulpit, showing only his shoulders, then suddenly rising, bending as if stricken with grief, he wiped his eyes with a loud rustling of starched muslin. He threw his arms into the air, to the right and to the left, assuming the attitudes of a wounded pelican. This was the bouquet, the finale, the morceau for the grand orchestra, the varied scene of the denouement. Weep, weep, wailed he, with expiring breath. Weep for yourselves, weep for me, weep for God. The little baronne was now altogether asleep, with her eyes open. The heat, the incense, and the growing shadows had, as it were, stupefied her. She had humped herself together, she had shut herself up in the delightful sensations she was experiencing, and, in secret, was dreaming of very agreeable things. Before her, in the Chapelle de saint Agne, was a huge fresco, representing a group of handsome young men, half-clad with wings on their backs. They smiled like chilly lovers while from their bent, kneeling attitudes they seemed to be adoring some invisible little baron. What fine fellows they were, with their delicate lips, their satin skin, and their muscular arms. The worst of it was that one of them strongly resembled the young Duc de Paix, one of the little baron's most intimate friends. In her sleep she asked herself if it could possibly be the Duc, half clad with wings on his back. And at times she imagined that the tall pink cherub had on the duke's black coat. 
Then the dream assumed a positive character. It was actually the Duke, very sparingly clothed, who, from the depths of the gloom, was sending her kisses. When the little Baron awoke, she heard the vicar utter the sacramental phrase, And it is the grace that I wish you. She sat for an instant in astonishment. She thought that the vicar was wishing her the young Duke's kisses. There was a loud rattling of chairs. Everybody departed. The little Baron had guessed correctly. Her coachman was not yet at the foot of the steps. That friend of a vicar had hurried up his sermon, stealing from his fair penitence at least twenty minutes of eloquence. And as the little Baron was walking about impatiently in a side aisle, she encountered the vicar who had precipitately quitted the sacristy. He looked at his watch. He had the hurried air of a man who does not wish to miss an appointment. "'Ah, how late I am, my dear madame,' said he. "'I am expected at the Countess, you know. There is to be a delightful concert, followed by a little collation. End of section 32「Section 33 of the Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The Marquise's Shoulders by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. The Marquise was asleep in her huge bed beneath broad curtains of yellow satin. At noon, as the clear tones of the clock were heard, she decided to open her eyes. The chamber was lukewarm. The carpet and the hangings of the doors and windows made it a soft nest into which the cold could not come. Warmth and perfumes loaded the atmosphere, and perpetual spring reigned there. As soon as she was fully awake, the Marquise seemed to be seized upon by a sudden anxiety. She threw back the bedclothes and rang for Julie. Madame rang? Tell me, is it thawing? Oh, the kind-hearted Marquise! With what an anxious voice she asked this question! Her first thought was for the terrible cold, the piercing north wind, which she did not feel, but which must blow so cruelly in the hovels of the poor. And she asked if heaven had been merciful, if she could be warm without remorse, without thinking of those who were shivering. Is it thawing, Julie? The waiting maid offered her the morning wrapper, which she had first warmed before a roaring fire. Oh, no, madame, it is not thawing. On the contrary, it is freezing harder than ever. Early this morning a man was found frozen to death in an omnibus. The Marquise displayed a childish joy. She clapped her hands, exclaiming, Ah, so much the better. I will go skating this afternoon. Julie drew aside the curtains gently, that a sudden brightness might not wound the tender sight of the delicious Marquise. The bluish reflection of the snow filled the chamber with a gay light. The sky was gray, but the tint was so pretty that it reminded the Marquise of a pearl-gray silk dress she had worn, the previous evening, at the ball of the ministry. This dress was trimmed with white guipure, like those nets of snow which she saw at the edges of the roofs, against the paleness of the sky. The previous evening she was charming with her new diamonds. She went to bed at five o'clock in the morning. Hence her head was yet a trifle heavy. Nevertheless, she seated herself before a mirror, and Julie raised the flaxen flood of her tresses. The wrapper slipped down, and the Marquise's shoulders were bare to the middle of her back. An entire generation had already grown old while gazing at the Marquise's shoulders. Since ladies of a joyous nature, thanks to a sovereign power, had been enabled to wear low-necked dresses and dance at the Tuileries, she had displayed her shoulders amid the crowds in the official salons with an assiduity which had made her the living sign of the charms of the Second Empire. She had been compelled to follow the fashion, to cut down her dresses, and now almost to the small of the back, now almost to the center of the bosom, and so it chanced that the dear little lady had— little by little, made public all the treasures of her corsage. There was not a spot as large as the palm of one's hand of her back and her bosom which was not known from the Madeleine to St. Thomas de Caen. The Marquise's shoulders, fully displayed, were the voluptuous coat of arms of the reign. 
it certainly is unnecessary to describe the marquise's shoulders they are as popular as the pont neuf for eighteen years they have formed part of the public spectacles one needs to see only the smallest bit of them in a salon at the theatre or elsewhere to exclaim ha ah, there's the marquise i recognize the black mole on her left shoulder besides those shoulders are very handsome very white very plump and very enticing the glances of every member of the government have swept over them making them smooth and shiny like granite pavements which eventually become polished through the constant scraping of the feet of the crowd if i were the marquise's husband or admirer i would much rather kiss the glass knob of the door of a minister's office worn by the hands of favor seekers than touch with my lips those shoulders over which has passed the hot breath of all of gallant paris when one thinks of the thousands of longings which have quivered around them one cannot help asking oneself of what kind of clay nature molded them that they have not been gnawed and crumbled like those marble statues exposed to the open air in gardens the symmetry of which has been destroyed by the winds the marquise has laid her modesty on the shelf she has made her shoulders an institution and how she has fought for the government of her choice always in the breach everywhere at the same time at the tuileries at the houses of the ministers at the foreign legations and at the hotels of ordinary millionaires winning over the undecided with her smiles propping the throne with her alabaster bosom showing on days of danger delicious little corners ordinarily hidden more persuasive than the arguments of orders more effective than the swords of soldiers and threatening in order to carry off a vote to cut down the necks of her dresses until the most ferocious members of the opposition should declare themselves convinced such was ever her mode of warfare the marquise's shoulders have remained intact and have always been victorious they have borne the weight of a world yet never has a wrinkle ruffled their white marble surface that afternoon on coming from the hands of julie the marquise clad in a delicious polish toilette went to skate she skates adorably at the bois it was as cold as the arctic regions a sharp wind stung the noses and the lips of the ladies as if fine sand had been blown in their faces the marquise laughed it amused her to be cold she went from time to time to warm her feet at the fires kindled on the edges of the little lake then she returned to the icy air speeding away over the frozen surface like a swallow grazing the ground ah what exquisite enjoyment and how fortunate it was that the thaw had not yet begun the marquise would be able to skate the whole week as she was on her way home the marquise saw in a side path of the champs elysees a poor woman shivering at the foot of a tree half dead with cold what a fright she murmured in an irritated tone and as her carriage was being driven very rapidly along the marquise unable to find her purse threw her bouquet to the poor woman a bouquet of white lilacs worth fully five louis end of section thirty three section thirty four of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. My Neighbor Jacques by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. At that time I inhabited in the Rue Gracieuse, the garret of my twentieth year. The Rue Gracieuse is a steep lane which descends the Butte Saint-Victor behind the Jardin des Plantes. I climbed up three stories the houses are low in that vicinity aiding myself with a rope in order not to slip upon the worn steps and thus i reached my den in the most complete obscurity the room big and cold had the bareness the wan light of a cellar i have however had bright sunshine in that gloom on the days when my heart rejoiced then there came to me childish laughter from the adjoining garret which was peopled by an entire family the father the mother and a girl between seven and eight years old the father had an angular air his head planted sideways between two pointed shoulders his bony visage was yellow with big black eyes plunged beneath thick eyebrows this man amid his lugubrious looks preserved a kindly timid smile he was like a great baby of fifty 
embarrassed, blushing like a girl. He sought the darkness, gliding along the walls with the humility of a pardoned galley slave. A few salutations exchanged between us had made me his friend. I was pleased with that strange face, full of an uneasy good nature. Little by little we had got to shaking hands. At the expiration of six months I was still ignorant of the trade by which my neighbor Jacques and his family subsisted. He spoke but little. I had indeed, out of pure interest, questioned his wife two or three times, but had succeeded only in drawing from her evasive replies, stammered forth with embarrassment. One day, it had rained the previous evening, and my heart was sad, as I was going down the Boulevard d'Enfer, I saw, coming toward me, one of those pariahs of the working people of Paris, a man clad in black, with a hat of the same color, and a white cravat, holding under his arm the small coffin of a newborn baby. He was walking with his head down, bearing his light burden with a dreamy heedlessness, pushing with his foot the pebbles from the sidewalk. The morning was clear. I felt pleased at that sadness which was passing. At the sound of my footsteps the man raised his head, then turned it away quickly, but too late. I had recognized him. My neighbor Jacques was an undertaker. I watched him going away, ashamed of his shame. I regretted not having taken the other alley. He was going away, with his head lower still, doubtless saying to himself that he had lost the shake of the hand which we exchanged every evening. The next day I met him on the stairs. He drew himself timidly against the wall, shrinking, pulling in with humility the folds of his blouse, that the cloth might not touch my garments. He stood there with bowed forehead, and I saw his poor gray head trembling with emotion. I halted, looking him in the face. I offered him my wide-open hand. He raised his head, hesitated, looked me in the face in his turn. I saw his big eyes blink and his yellow visage grow red. Then suddenly taking my arm, he accompanied me to my garret, where, at last, he recovered his speech. "'You are a brave young man,' he said to me. "'The grasp of your hand has made me forget many evil glances.' And he sat down, making his confession to me. He admitted to me that, before being in the business, he had felt uneasy, like the rest, whenever he had met an undertaker. But since that time, during his long hours of walking, amid the silence of funerals, he had thought over these things, he had been astonished at the disgust and fear which he aroused as he passed by. I was twenty years old then. I would have embraced an executioner. I plunged into philosophical considerations, striving to prove to my neighbor Jacques that his calling was holy. But he shrugged his pointed shoulders, rubbed his hands in silence, then resumed in his slow and embarrassed voice. You see, monsieur, the gossip of the quarter and the unfriendly looks of the passers-by disturb me little, provided that my wife and daughter have bread. Only one thing troubles me. I cannot sleep at night when I think about it. We are, my wife and I, old folks who no longer feel the shame of the thing. But young girls are ambitious. My poor Martha will blush for me later on. When she was five years of age she saw one of my colleagues, and she wept so much she was so afraid that I have not yet dared to put on the black cloak before her. I dress and undress myself on the stairs. I felt pity for my neighbor Jacques. I offered to allow him to keep his garments in my chamber and come there to put them on at his ease, sheltered from the cold. He took a thousand precautions in transporting his sinister wardrobe to my abode. From that day I saw him regularly, morning and evening. He made his toilette in a corner of my mansard. I had an old chest, the wood of which was crumbling, bored by worms. My neighbor Jacques made it his clothes press. He put newspapers on the bottom of it, upon which he delicately folded his black garments. At times, during the night, when a nightmare had wakened me with a start, I cast a frightened glance at the old chest, which stretched out against the wall like a coffin. It seemed to me that then I saw the hat, the black cloak, and the white cravat come out of it. The hat rolled around my bed, snorting and leaping, with little nervous jumps. The cloak spread out, and shaking its parts like great black wings, flew about the large and silent chamber. The white cravat stretched out, then began to crawl softly towards me, its head raised, its tail wagging. Then I would open my eyes very widely, and I would see the old chest motionless and somber in its corner. I was living in a dream at that period, a dream of love and sadness also. I took pleasure in my nightmare. 
I loved my neighbor Jacques because he lived with the dead and brought me the biting odors of cemeteries. He had made confidential revelations to me. I was writing the opening pages of The Memoirs of an Undertaker. In the evening, my neighbor Jacques, before disrobing himself, sat down on the old chest to give me an account of what he had done that day. He loved to talk about his dead. Now it was a young girl, the poor child, dead of consumption, was not heavy. Then it was an old man, that old man, whose coffin had strained his arms, was a big official, who must have carried his gold away with him in his pockets. And I had private details about each corpse. I knew their weight, the sounds that had been heard in their coffins, the way in which it had been necessary to take them downstairs, at the turns of the staircases. It happened, on certain evenings, that my neighbor Jacques came home more loquacious and more expansive than usual. Then he would lean against the walls, his cloak hooked over his shoulder, his hat thrown back. He had met generous heirs who had treated him to the drink and cheese of consolation. And he would finish up by growing tender. He would swear to me that he would bury me when the time should come with friendly gentleness. I lived thus for more than a year in an atmosphere of death. One morning my neighbor Jacques did not make his appearance. Eight days afterwards he was dead. When two of his colleagues took away the body I was at my door. I heard them joke as they went downstairs with the coffin, which gave forth a hollow sound like a complaint at each knock it received. One of them, a short fat fellow, said to the other, a long slim fellow, he is going to join his customers. End of section 34。section 35 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。recording by beth thomas。big michu。by emile zola。translated by george d cox。one afternoon at four o'clock recess big michu took me aside into a corner of the courtyard he had a grave air which filled me with a certain fear for big michu was a fellow with enormous fists whom i would not have had for my enemy for anything in the world listen said he to me in his thick voice of a but partially polished peasant listen will you go into it i answered unhesitatingly yes flattered by the proposition to go into something with big michu then he explained to me that a conspiracy was on foot the confidential revelations he made to me gave me a delicious sensation the like of which i have perhaps never experienced since at last i had entered into the wild adventures of life i would have a secret to keep a battle to fight and in sooth the unavowed fright i felt at the idea of compromising myself in this way constituted a full half of the biting joys of my new role of accomplice likewise while big michu was talking i stood before him lost in admiration he initiated me in a somewhat rough tone as if i were a conscript in whose energy he had but a mediocre confidence however the quiver of pleasure the air of enthusiastic ecstasy i displayed while listening to him ultimately gave him a better opinion of me at the second stroke of the bell as we took our places in the ranks to return to the schoolroom he said to me in a low tone it is understood, is it not? You are one of us. You will not be afraid. At least, you will not betray us. Oh, no, you shall see. I have sworn it. He looked me full in the face with his grey eyes, with the dignity of a mature man, and added, If you betray us, of course, I shall not thrash you. But I will tell everybody you are a traitor, and then nobody will speak to you again. I still remember the strange effect this threat produced on me. It gave me colossal courage. Bast, said I to myself, I don't care if they give me two thousand verses. The deuce take me if ever I betray Michu. I awaited the dinner hour with feverish impatience. The revolt was to burst forth in the refectory. Big Michu was from Var. His father, a peasant who possessed a few patches of land, had taken part in the insurrection provoked by the coup d'etat in 51. Left for dead upon the plain of Ushan, he had succeeded in hiding himself. When he reappeared, nobody disturbed him. But the authorities of the district, the notables, the people with large and small incomes, called him that brigand of a Michu. This brigand, this honest, illiterate man, sent his son to the College de Blanc 
doubtless he wished him to be learned for the triumph of the cause which he himself had been able to defend only with weapons in his hands we had a vague acquaintance with this history at the college which made us regard our comrade as a very formidable personage big michu was besides much older than we were he was nearly eighteen although he was still only in the fourth class but no one dared to twit him with his backwardness he was one of those slow students who learn with difficulty who guess nothing yet when he once knew a thing he knew it thoroughly and never forgot it as strong as if hewn out with an axe he reigned like a sovereign during recess with this he was extremely gentle i never saw him angry but once when he wished to strangle a tutor because he taught us that all republicans were robbers and assassins this came near to causing his expulsion it was only later when i again saw my former comrade in my recollections that i was able to comprehend his gentle and firm attitude his father had early made a man of him big michu liked being at the college a fact which somewhat astonished us he experienced there but one torment of which he was afraid to speak hunger big michu was always hungry i never saw anybody with such an appetite so far as i can remember excessively proud as he was he sometimes stooped to the most humiliating farces in order to trick us out of a morsel of bread a breakfast or a lunch raised in the open air at the foot of the chain of the Morves, he suffered still more cruelly than we from the poor fare of the college this poor fare was one of our principal topics of conversation in the courtyard along the wall which shaded us with its strip of shadow we were dainty i remember especially a certain preparation of codfish with red sauce and certain beans with white sauce which had become the objects of general malediction the days when these dishes appeared we were loud in our complaints big michu from human decency cried out with us though he would have been delighted to gulp down the six portions of his table big michu complained only of the small quantity of the food chance as if to exasperate him had placed him at the end of the table beside a tutor a thin young man who allowed us to fume at our pleasure the rule was that the tutors had each a right to two portions hence when sausages were served it was a sight to see big michu gaze at the two pieces stretched out side by side upon the slim tutor's plate i am twice his size said big michu to me one day and yet he has twice as much to eat as i have he leaves not a morsel either he never has too much now the leaders had resolved that we should at least revolt against the codfish with red sauce and the beans with white sauce naturally the conspirators invited big michu to be their chief the plan of these rebels was of a heroic simplicity it would suffice they thought to martyrize their appetites to refuse all food until the head of the college solemnly declared that the bill of fare should be ameliorated the approbation which big michu gave to this plan was one of the most sublime examples of abnegation and courage i know of he accepted the leadership of the movement with the calm heroism of those ancient romans who sacrificed themselves for the public good think of it being his duty to make the codfish and beans disappear when he desired only to have more of them to have as much as he could eat and to cap the climax he was required to fast he confessed to me afterwards that never was that republican virtue taught him by his father solidarity the devotion of the individual to the interests of the community put to so severe a proof in him that evening in the refectory it was the day of the codfish with red sauce the martyrization began with a unanimity truly beautiful to behold bread alone was permitted the hated dish arrived we did not touch it but ate our bread dry and this gravely without talking in low tones as was our custom only the younger students laughed big michu was superb he went so far that first evening as to abstain even from bread he put both his elbows on the table and looked disdainfully at the thin tutor who was eating away with a will meanwhile the superintendent had sent for the head of the college who burst into the refectory like a tempest he took us roughly to task asking us what fault we could possibly find with the dinner which he tasted and declared exquisite then big michu arose monsieur said he the codfish is spoiled we cannot put up with it ah, cried the thin tutor without giving the head of the college time to reply on other evenings you have nevertheless managed to devour nearly the entire dish yourself big michu colored to the roots of his hair that evening they simply sent us to bed telling us that by the morrow reflection would put us in a more reasonable frame of mind 
The next day, and the next, Big Michu was terrible. The words of the thin tutor had stricken him to the heart. He kept up our courage. He told us we would be cowards if we yielded. Now he had put all his pride in showing that, when so disposed, he could do without eating. He was a real martyr. All the rest of us had hidden away in our desks chocolate, pots of preserves, and even liver puddings, which enabled us not to eat altogether dry bread, with which we had filled our pockets. But he, who had not a single relative in the town, and who, besides, refused himself such luxuries, kept strictly to the few crusts he was able to find. On the third day, the head of the college, having declared that since the pupils obstinately persisted in not touching the dishes provided, he was about to stop the distribution of bread, the revolt assumed formidable proportions at breakfast. It was the day of beans with white sauce. Big Michu, whose brain must have been disturbed by atrocious hunger, suddenly arose. He seized the plate of the thin tutor, who was eating with all his might to defy us and fill us with envy, and hurled it into the middle of the hall. Then he began to sing the Marseillaise in a loud voice. This was like a great gust of wind in its effect. It set all of us in motion. The plates, glasses and bottles danced a pretty dance. The tutors, striding over the wrecks, hastened to abandon the refectory to us. The thin tutor in his flight received a dish of beans upon the shoulders, the source of which spread out on him like a broad white collar. Then it was proposed that we should fortify the room. Big Michu was appointed general. He caused the tables to be brought and heaped up against the doors. I remember that we all had taken our knives in our hands. The Marseillaise was yet being thundered forth. The revolt had become a revolution. Happily they left us to ourselves for three whole hours. The fact was that they had sent for the guard. Those three hours of noise sufficed to calm us. At the lower end of the refectory were two large windows which opened upon the courtyard. The most timid, frightened by the long immunity accorded us, softly opened one of these windows and vanished. They were gradually followed by other pupils. Soon, Big Michu had only ten insurgents left around him. He said to them in a bitter tone, Go, join the rest. One culprit will be enough. Seeing that I hesitated, he turned towards me and added, Don't you understand? I release you from your oath. When the guard broke open one of the doors, Big Michu was found all alone, tranquilly seated on the end of the table amid the broken plates. That very night he was sent home to his father. As for us, we gained but little from the revolt. They did indeed avoid serving us with codfish and beans for several weeks. Then they reappeared. Only the codfish had white sauce and the beans red sauce. A long while afterwards, I again met Big Michu. He had been unable to continue his studies. He was cultivating in his turn a few patches of land left him by his father, then deceased. I would have made he said to me, a wretched lawyer, or a wretched physician, as it was very difficult to get anything into my head. It is better for me to be a peasant. That's my affair, though. But no matter. That was a scurvy trick the pupils played on me at college. And just think how I adored the codfish and beans, too. End of section 35「Section 36 of The Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. A Strange Philosopher by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. One of my friends, a young chemist, said to me one morning, I am acquainted with an aged scientist who has retired to a small house on the Boulevard d'Enfer, there to study, without interruption, the crystallization of diamonds. He has already obtained dazzling results. Would you like me to take you to see him? I replied in the affirmative, though not without a secret terror. A magician would have frightened me less, for I stand in but slight dread of the devil, but I am afraid of wealth and I am free to admit that the man who one of these days shall discover the philosopher's stone will fill me with a respectful fear. As we walked along, my friend gave me some information in regard to the manufacture of artificial precious stones. Our chemists had been lending it their attention for a long time, but the crystals heretofore formed were of such small size and the cost of producing them so great that the experiments were looked upon simply as revelations of the curiosities of science. 
It was simply a question of finding more powerful agents and more economical methods in order to turn out the precious stones at a lower figure. Meanwhile, we had reached our destination. My friend, before ringing the bell, warned me that the aged scientist who had no love for curious intruders would certainly accord me a most ungracious reception. I was the first outsider who had attempted to penetrate into his sanctum sanctorum. The scientist opened the door, and I must confess that at first I thought he had a stupid air, the air of a cadaverous, low-lived shoemaker. He received my friend politely, accepting me with a low growl as if I had been a dog belonging to his young disciple. We crossed a neglected garden, at the extremity of which stood the house, a dilapidated hovel. The tenant had torn down all the partitions that he might have but one vast and lofty apartment. There he had established a complete laboratory outfit, consisting of strange appliances, the use of which I did not even try to comprehend. The only articles of luxury, the only pieces of furniture, were a bench and a table of black wood. In this den I saw the most dazzling, the most blinding sight I had ever witnessed in my whole life. Along the walls, upon the floor, were ranged numbers of wretched baskets, the willow twigs of which were ready to burst, full to overflowing, with precious stones. Each basket contained but one species of gem. Rubies, amethysts, emeralds, sapphires, opals and turquoises, thrown into corners like shovelfuls of stones on the sides of a highway, shone with living light, illuminating the apartment with the sparkle of their flames. They were furnaces, glowing coals, red, violet, green, blue and pink. One might have imagined that millions of elfin eyes were laughing on the floor amid the gloom. Never did Arabian tale display such treasures, never had woman dreamed of such a paradise. I could not suppress a cry of admiration. What wealth! I exclaimed. The value of these gems is incalculable. The aged scientist shrugged his shoulders. He gazed at me with an air of deep pity. Each of these heaps is worth but a few francs, said he in his drawling and hollow voice. They embarrass me. Tomorrow I will scatter them over the alleys of my garden to serve as gravel. Then, turning toward my friend, he continued, taking up handfuls of the gems. Look at these rubies. They are the most beautiful I have yet obtained. I am not satisfied with these emeralds. They are too pure. Those which nature makes always have some fault, and I don't desire to surpass nature. What discourages me is that I am still unable to produce the white diamond. I shall recommence my experiments tomorrow. When I have succeeded, the crowning work of my life will be achieved, and I shall die happy. The scientist had drawn himself up to his full height. I no longer thought he had a stupid air. I began to tremble in the presence of this one old man who could flood Paris with a miraculous rain. You are afraid of robbers, are you not? I asked. I see solid bars of iron across your doors and windows. It is well to take precautions. Yes, I am afraid sometimes, he murmured. Afraid lest idiots may murder me before I have produced the white diamond. These stones, which really have but little value, might tempt my heirs. My heirs terrify me. They are well aware that by causing my disappearance, they would bury with me the secrets of my discoveries, thus preserving the full value which the world places on the artificial precious stones you see about you. He grew thoughtful and sad. We were seated on heaps of diamonds, and I looked at him, my left hand plunged into a basket of rubies, my right mechanically sifting handfuls of emeralds, as children sift sand between their fingers. After silence had reigned for some time, I cried out, "'You must lead an intolerable life, hating men as you do. Have you no pleasure whatever?' He stared at me in surprise. "'I toil,' replied he simply. "'I am never weary. When I feel in an unusually gay mood, I put a few of these stones in my pocket and station myself at the further end of my garden, behind a loophole which opens upon the boulevard.' There, from time to time, I cast a diamond into the midst of the street. He laughed at the remembrance of this excellent practical joke. You cannot imagine the grimaces of the people who find the stones. They tremble and glance behind them. Then they make their escape, as pale as death. Ah, the poor fools, how much amusement they have afforded me. I have passed many joyous hours at that loophole. His dry tone gave me inexpressible uneasiness. Evidently the aged scientist was making game of me. 
See here, young man, resumed he, I have in this hovel sufficient means to buy a whole army of women, but I am an old devil. You can readily understand that if I possessed the least ambition, I would have been a king somewhere long ago. Bah! I would not injure a fly. I am kind-hearted, and that is why I allow men to live. He could not have told me more politely that, if the fancy should take possession of him, he would send me to the scaffold. Bewildering thoughts ran through my brain, ringing in my ears all the bells of madness. The elfin eyes of the precious stones stared at me, with their piercing glances, red, violet, green, blue, and pink. I had closed my hands without knowing it. I held in my left a handful of rubies, in my right a handful of emeralds, and, if I must tell the entire truth, an almost irresistible desire urged me to slip them into my pockets. But I dropped those accursed stones and quitted the strange philosopher's house, seeming to hear the gallop of gendarmes all the way to my residence. End of section 36section 37 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by beth thomas out of work by emile zola translated by george d cox the original sketch as written by emile zola that suggested la samoir one morning when the workmen reached the workshop they found it cold and gloomy, as with the sadness of ruin. At the extremity of the huge hall, the steam engine was dumb, with its thin shafts and motionless wheels, and it added to the melancholy of the scene, that engine, the puffing and tossing of which ordinarily animated the entire establishment with the beating of a giant's heart noisily at work. The proprietor emerged from his little office. He said to the workman, with an air of sorrow, "'My good fellows, there is nothing for you to do today.' The orders have ceased to come in. From every side, purchases have been countermanded, and the merchandise will remain on my hands. The month of December, upon which I counted, that month of heavy work in other years, threatens to ruin the most solid houses. Everything must be suspended. And as he saw the workmen look at each other with the fear of returning home, the fear of hunger on the morrow, he added in a lower tone, I am not selfish. No, I swear it to you. My situation is as terrible as yours more terrible, perhaps. In a week I have lost fifty thousand francs. I stop the work today that I may not increase the depth of the gulf, and I have not the first sou towards making my payments on the fifteenth. You see that I speak to you as a friend, that I hide nothing from you. Tomorrow, doubtless, the bailiffs will be here. It is not our fault, is it? We have struggled to the last. I would like to bridge the chasm for you, but all is over. I am on the ground." I have no longer bread to share with anyone. Then he extended his hand to them. The workmen grasped it silently, and for several minutes they stood there, gazing at their useless tools with clenched fists. Other mornings, from the hour of dawn, the files had been wont to scrape, the hammers to mark rhythm, and all that seemed already slumbering in the dust of bankruptcy. Twenty, thirty families would not eat the coming week. Some women who toiled in the manufactory had tears in their eyes. The men strove to appear firmer. They assumed courage. They said that one did not die of hunger in Paris. Then, when the proprietor quitted them, and they saw him depart, bent in a week, crushed, perhaps, by a disaster greater than he would admit, they withdrew, one by one, suffocating in the hall, their throats oppressed, their hearts chilled, as if they were leaving the chamber of a dead man. The corpse was work, the huge mute steam engine, the skeleton of which was sinister in the gloom. A workman was outside in the street upon the pavement. For a week he had haunted the sidewalks without being able to find work. He went from door to door, offering his arms, offering his hands, offering himself bodily for no matter what toil, the most disagreeable, the hardest, the most deadly. Every door was closed against him. Then the workman offered to labour for half price but the doors remained closed. If he would work for nothing, nobody could employ him. Toil was at a standstill, the terrible standstill which sounds the knell of the mansards. The panic had stopped every industry, and money, cowardly money, had hidden itself away. After the week had passed, the end had indeed come. 
the workman had made a desperate attempt and was returning slowly, his hands empty, broken down by want. It was raining. That evening Paris was funereal in the mud. He walked beneath the heavy shower without feeling it, comprehending only that he was hungry, pausing that he might not reach home too quickly. He leaned over a parapet of the Seine. The swollen waters rushed by with an incessant noise. Jets of white foam were torn asunder by a pile of the bridge. He leaned further over. The tremendous flood passed beneath him, casting at him a furious summons. Then he said to himself that it would be cowardly to commit suicide, and went away. The rain had ceased. The gas shone in the jeweller's windows. If he were to break a pane of glass, he could snatch enough with one hand to keep him in bread for years. The kitchens of the restaurants were lighted up, and behind the white muslin curtains he saw people eating. He hastened his steps, hurried towards the Faubourg, passing cookshops, pork vendors' shops, pastry shops, all ravenous Paris, which exhibits itself during the hours of hunger. How his wife and little daughter had wept that morning. He had promised to bring them bread in the evening. He had not dared to return to tell them that he had lied before nightfall. As he walked along, he asked himself how he should enter, what he should say to make them patient. Still, they could not remain longer without something to eat. He would try to do so, but his wife and child were too weak. And for an instant he thought of begging. But when a lady or gentleman passed him, his arms grew rigid, his throat became stopped up. He stood planted upon the sidewalk, while well-regulated people turned away, thinking him intoxicated from the wild, famished look on his face. The workman's wife had come down to the door, leaving the child upstairs. The poor woman was very thin and wore a calico dress. She shivered in the icy blasts of the street. Nothing remained in the house. She had taken everything to the Mont de Piété. A week without work suffices to empty a hovel. The day before, she had sold to a junk dealer the last handful of wool from her mattress. The mattress filling had all gone that way. Now only the ticking was left. She had hung that before the window to keep out the air, for the child coughed very badly. Without mentioning it to her husband, she also had sought for work. But the stoppage of industry affected the women more severely than the men. In rooms upon the same floor as hers were unfortunate creatures whom she heard sob all night long. She had seen one of these wretched women standing like a statue at a street corner. Another who had lived in the rooms was dead. A third had disappeared. She, happily, had a good husband, a husband who did not drink. They would have been in comfortable circumstances if the dull seasons had not robbed them of everything. She had exhausted her credit everywhere. She owed the baker, the grocer, the fruiterer, and was afraid even to pass their shops. That afternoon she had gone to her sister's house to borrow twenty sous, but there she found also such poverty that she burst into tears without saying a word, and for a long while her sister and she wept together. Then, as she departed, she promised to bring her sister a morsel of bread if her husband should return with anything. Her husband had not returned. It was raining, and the woman took refuge within the doorway. Huge drops of water pattered about her feet, and the dampness penetrated her thin dress. Sometimes, growing impatient, she went out despite the storm and ran to the corner of the street to see if she could not catch a glimpse of the man for whom she was waiting in the distance upon the sidewalk. And when she came back, she was wet through and through. She passed her hands over her hair to dry it. She strove to be patient a little longer, shaken by slight feverish quivers. The passers-by elbowed her. She contracted herself that she might not be in anybody's way. Men stared her in the face. She felt at times their warm breath strike her cheeks. All suspicious Paris, the street with its mud, its glaring lights, and its clatter of vehicles, seemed to wish to seize her and hurl her into the gutter. She was hungry, and everybody had a right to crush her. Opposite, there was a baker's shop, and she thought of her child asleep upstairs. Then, when her husband at last appeared, slinking like a wretch along the houses, she precipitated herself towards him and looked at him anxiously, well stammered she he bowed his head without reply then she ascended the stairs before him pale as death upstairs the child no longer slept she had awakened she was thinking her eyes fixed on a candle stump slowly burning away upon the corner of the table it is impossible to describe the monstrous and heart-rending expression on the face of that girl of seven 
with the faded and serious features of a woman grown. She was seated upon the edge of a chest which served her for a bed. Her bare feet hung down shivering. Her hands, like those of a puny doll, had drawn against her breast the rags which covered it. She felt a burning sensation there, a fire she wished to extinguish. She was thinking. She had never had any playthings. She could not go to school because she had no shoes. She remembered that when she was younger, her mother had taken her out in the sunshine. But that was long ago. They were compelled to remove from their home, and since then, it seemed to her, that terrible cold had reigned in their house. Besides, she was always hungry. Was everybody hungry? This was a grave question which she could ask herself, but which she could not answer. She had, however, tried to accustom herself to hunger, but without success. She thought that she was too little, that one must be big to know why people were famished. Her mother, doubtless, knew that reason which was hidden from children. If she had dared, she would have asked her, who brought people into the world to be hungry? Besides, everything in their room was so miserable. She looked at the window, against which the mattress ticking was beating, the bare walls, the broken furniture, all that wretchedness of a garret which lack of work stains with its despair. In her ignorance, she believed that she had dreamed of warm apartments, with beautiful objects in them which shone. She closed her eyes to see all this again, and through her emaciated eyelids the glare of the candle became a vast golden brightness into which she wished to make her way. But the wind roared, and such a current of air came in through the window that she was seized with a fit of coughing. Her eyes filled with tears. Formerly she was afraid when left alone. Now it made no difference to her. As they had not eaten since the previous day, she thought her mother had gone to get bread. Then she amused herself with the idea of eating. She would cut her bread into tiny morsels, which she would devour slowly one by one. She would play with her bread. Her mother returned. Her father closed the door. The child stared at their hands, greatly surprised. And as her parents said nothing, after a moment had elapsed, she cried in a whining tone, I'm hungry! I'm hungry! Her father had covered his face with his hands in a dark corner. He sat there, crushed, his shoulders shaken by bitter, silent sobs. Her mother, forcing back her tears, put her to bed again upon the chest. She covered her with all the old garments in the room, telling her to be quiet, to go to sleep. But the child, whose teeth were chattering with the cold, and who felt the fire in her breast burn with greater intensity, grew very bold. She threw her arms around her mother's neck, and then she whispered softly, Why are we hungry? Tell me, Mama. The End End of Section 37 End of The Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox